They need the military capability. They need the political power, economic power of the United States uh, to help them uh, in their national or regional issues. And without that U.S. leadership, you know, their fear is that, okay, they won't bring the um, national elements of power to bear that, that are needed to solve the problem. Uh, but at the same time, I always caution the U.S. folks about uh, avoiding the sense of dominance or control or arrogance, worst case, uh, that sometimes comes with that. Uh, and therefore, you know, we have to be very, very wary of the fact that we need to lead, lead in the most inclusive way as possible and with a real thorough understanding of all the dynamics of a problem. And we have to buy into the fact that once we sign up to a coalition effort or to an alliance effort, we lose some of the elements of control because we're signing up to common objectives, common resources, common assessment that might be slightly different from a U.S. only uh, you know, view on all of those things. Let me get a basic starting point. What kind of operations is NATO involved in at this moment in time? Well, NATO is involved in four operations. International Security Assistance Force Afghanistan transitioning to resident support. Two is Kosovo Force, K4, which is going on 15 years. It's also in transition. Then we have two maritime operations, Operation Active Endeavor, our only Article 5 operation in the Mediterranean, uh, counterterrorism is its focus, and then Operation Ocean Shield off the Horn of Africa, Gulf of Aden, Indian Ocean, countering piracy. The uh, three standing missions, we have one that's, uh, frankly, a ballistic missile defense mission. It's an interim uh, capability right now, but we've got an Aegis cruiser in the eastern Mediterranean and a uh, ground-based radar in Turkey uh, that covers a, a potential ballistic missile threat from the southeast uh, over four, at least right now, four uh, NATO nations. Uh, that will grow over time. We have a, a standing uh, integrated air and missile defense mission uh, that is primarily exemplified by air policing and quick reaction aircraft across the Alliance air space. And then finally, we have the NATO support to Turkey mission right now, which is uh, a theater ballistic missile defense covering three uh, cities and their populations in southern Turkey against a ballistic missile threat from Syria. So in your position, operations and intelligence working within NATO, are there lessons that you're learning here that you could share with the military back in the States? What I most enjoy about uh, being in a, in a NATO staff position like I am now and working previously in a, in a multinational headquarters uh, is the um, absolute emphasis on inclusivity. We approach things uh, automatically from the point of view that in order to understand a problem better, we need to uh, include other perspectives uh, there, there are going to be a clash of views and perspectives in the dialogue to understand a problem because it's just natural when you bring together nations from all sorts of diverse backgrounds who have sometimes completely different world views. It's that facing every problem with the idea that you need to include and then merge you know, perspectives to come up with the best understanding. And then in terms of uh, developing the solution to solve a problem, uh, you get a, a lot more variety in, in the approaches, it's, uh, which NATO calls a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, for U.S. military, it's the joint interagency, intergovernmental, uh, multinational approach, uh, which is uh, not a weakness of the U.S., it's a strength. But those tend to be, uh, there's a greater emphasis on the J-I and I over the M, the multinational. Um, there's lots of practice in the States on the J-I and I, there's a bit of uh, multinational um, you know, work certainly done in the COCOMs, but uh, that's still not necessarily done um, in a uh, equal um, egalitarian basis. Uh, yeah. It's the U.S. view that presides, it's the U.S. view that dominates, and uh, we feed in other views to make sure that the U.S. solution is as best as possible or that the multinational coalition led by that you know, U.S. effort. Uh, is as productive as possible. In the, in the NATO way, it starts from a egalitarian basis of all nations, and, uh, and therefore it's a slightly different view. So when you look to the situation in the Ukraine and also down into ISIS, ISIL, um, how do you prepare for those kinds of threats? First, uh, you know, NATO is a, a political and military alliance, uh, and all actions are guided, directed by the nations, starting from the North Atlantic Council. 
But uh, that doesn't prohibit us from prudent thinking. And so we spend a lot of time early on in crises, like both of these are, uh, trying to figure out what's the implication to us and you know, is there a, an appropriate military action that needs to be taken either to heighten our understanding and awareness or protect us from potential, you know, this potential threat. And so uh, in the first, first case, we are trying to um, develop understanding of the problem. And then we are then explaining the implications and recommended actions as a result of those uh, understanding the implications. Uh, sometime in that period, uh, we are generally um, paralleled you know, by a request from the NAC for further information uh, or cons you know, asking to consider certain things. And then it becomes a very collaborative process and trying to figure out what those uh, actions should be that might be appropriate. But uh, it's very much what we decide to do as Alliance is driven by decisions from above. We try to uh, provide secure the wherewithal to provide set strategic military advice upwards that's uh, relevant to the problem at hand. And sometimes he's in the position of recommending action, and sometimes he's just in the position of saying, this is, uh, this is the threat and here are, here are implications. Kind of inciting some dialogue and debate that would then come back to us in a tasking uh, for potential you know, military response. So if you could reach the U.S. audience with a message that would tell them about the importance of NATO, what would you say? To a U.S. audience, I would say that NATO matters to us. It is our strongest alliance. It's the only alliance uh, that has the large numbers that it has and represents a standing military capability to do something against uh, threats to the U.S., to our allies, et cetera. Obviously, it implies a huge commitment on our part because you know, we've committed ourselves to the uh, protection of all of our allies. But uh, it matters in that they bring to bear uh, capabilities and, uh, um, frankly, political legitimacy uh, to us in support of a threat that we see to the U.S. Uh, that may be part of a NATO response or uh, could be part of, as part of a separate, uh, you know, coalition or multinational response. Uh, we just need to recognize um, where some of our uh, interoperable contributions come from. They come from our experience in the alliance, our commitment to the, our European allies, and our investment time, you know, in their capabilities. Uh, through uh, partnering and, and uh, an alliance exercise training and operations.